All right, so uh, I come from Brooklyn, so I was thrilled to see the, the job growth there. I don't have the statistics, but I'm guessing that a majority of that comes from the entrepreneurial millennials that have food carts, right, selling $10 lobster rolls and $10 peanut butter and jelly sandwiches, which have taken up about, probably about 15% of my uh, income this year um, off of food carts. So very happy to be here. Um, uh, I've done several events with Columbia uh, in, in recent weeks and uh, thrilled to be with the Graduate uh, Alumni Network. So this is the, the uh, game plan for the next 30 minutes. We're going to walk through three sections. First, I'm going to uh, have fun with you. We're going to play a game called In the News. It's very similar to Wait, Wait, Don't Tell Me. We're going to look at stories that are basically weak signals of change, and your job is going to vote on whether you think it's true or false. Then I'm going to introduce one foresight framework uh, and kind of give you a little bit more background on you know, what it means to be a professional futurist, what it does not mean. Uh, then we're going to look at drivers of change, starting at the global level, um, looking down at, uh, and then walking ourselves down to uh, demographic transitions in the US um, and cities. And then we're going to uh, focus on the role that data is likely to play in the future job landscape. Uh, before ending with a couple tips and tricks, uh, uh, I tend to find three types of individuals when I do my presentations. There's the, the futurist, like, I'm going to start calling myself a futurist, right, which is bad for me. Um, and they're just, you know, they're on it, and they're excited, and they already are looking for trends. So what's your next step? Then there's the person that says, eh, this is an interesting, interesting presentation, but I don't have the time. I don't have the bandwidth. So what is that person's next step? And then there's the person that thinks I'm just a snake oil salesman. They can't, they can't believe the company's paid me to, to speak. Um, and you're a skeptic, right? So what, what would be your next steps? So that's, that, that's the uh, uh, agenda for the program. Uh, many of you may know Wait, Wait, Don't Tell Me is a game on NPR. It's a very expensive trademark. I borrowed liberally from the concept. My game is called In the News. Uh, so what we're going to do here is we're going to look at two stories. Um, and these are, again, stories that I've detected in the world. And your job is to tell me whether you think they're true or false. Now, if you think the story is true, I want you to kind of you know, go back to you know, your, your glory days, football games, some sort of event. Um, and I want you to stand up, and I want you to give me jazz hands, right, if you think that this is true, right? And if you're unable or unwilling to stand, just give me your best jazz hands, right? Um, and if you think it's false, I just want you to kind of fold your hands all grumpy like you don't want to play a game, right? So the first story comes out of the world of retail and HR, uh, deals with this trend of uh, micro-credentials. And the true false is, is Ben Sherman, large fashion brand across the pond, uh, now working with the Mozilla uh, Foundation on a series of badges, so micro-credentials, that reflect skills that have been demonstrated um, you know, with various institutions uh, that individuals have learned either inside a formal Ben Sherman training program or outside in some sort of non-traditional learning environment. So, you've been sitting for 30 minutes. I want to give you a chance to stand up. Stand up, give me your jazz hands if you think this is true. Fold your hands, look grumpy if you think it's false. Stay standing, right? So folks, look at these people. Columbia, it is a two-hand, two-hand jazz hands here. Look at these folks, right? These are the visionaries, the entrepreneurs, the risk takers in your alumni network, and they are wrong. They are wrong, they are wrong. But you're my people, you're my people. So what, what does this mean? Why is this important? So there are a lot of people uh, on the kind of evangelical side of badges, right? They've got companies that deal with badges and micro-credentialing, it is a part of their you know, to put bread on the table, they need to oversell and overhype this trend. So I'm admitting that there is a bit of overselling here. But there are also people out there that say, look, the world has fundamentally changed in terms of, you know, how people understand their skill sets and how employers understand what you can actually do. Uh, that goes much deeper uh, than having a degree from a particular institution, um, you know, that you received 10, 20 years ago. So there is this uh, expectation that there will be a breaking down process of our, of our skills building, and uh, badges are one form of micro-credential. So there are lots of people that think badges are great, and they're fantastic, and then there are other people that say, oh, we don't need your stinking badges, right? Um, 
So uh, this is true in a lot of places, and the conversation and the infrastructure building of, of digital badges through Mozilla is in its fourth year. So we're, we're starting to see uh, a little bit of traction with institutions. Um, one of them is the Manufacturing Institute, uh, so you know, blue-collar people, uh, that are starting to say, hey, individuals are taking courses and they're learning things uh, beyond traditional learning environments. Maybe badges will help us uh, make sense of that landscape. So uh, badges are you know, one way, micro-credentials are one way of telling that story. Um, when I'm speaking mostly to students, I like to highlight what I think is the evolution of uh, how individuals uh, maintain and prepare uh, for a re-entry into the job force, right? We all like to think that we're gonna hold on to our jobs, but we do need to be prepared for an event that leads to uh, us um, uh, in a job-seeking position. So resumes have been the traditional kind of chronological order. Uh, they remain very important, but mostly not on paper. They're most important uh, on sites like Monster and LinkedIn, where they can be scraped by you know, bots and algorithms that are looking for keywords. So what is important in our resume position is its machine readability, right? The ability for algorithms, not individuals, to understand uh, the spectrum of our skill sets. So resumes are important, but they're not the most important thing. Um, I think all individuals, regardless of, of your uh, 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 stature, kind of in your growth as a, as a professional, need to be constantly maintaining a portfolio. And a portfolio is that collection of experiences, uh, failures, and successes. What I see upticking in the world of of uh, employees and job seekers and individuals that are both freelance and also within um, large organizations is a greater push towards managing their online presence. Who you know, who is following you, what you're saying, what you think about the world reflects your online presence. So how do we think about our skills you know, beyond badges and micro-credentials, but all three of these uh, formats that tell very different stories. So second and final question, um, IBM made an announcement a few weeks ago that they were gonna be investing about a billion dollars in a new uh, unit uh, dedicated to uh, Watson. Um, so a little bit of background, Watson is a, let's basically call it a software application. Uh, based off of natural language interactions, right? It's essentially a decision support tool for individuals. And it became famous a few years ago when it beat uh, the two smartest people on Jeopardy, uh, kind of you know, wiped them off the stage um, in somewhat of a circus event uh, in 2011. So the true false here is, is IBM Watson now part of a pilot project with North Face in which they've created a personal intelligent assistant that helps deliver more contextual answers through conversation with the person that's in the store or online. So you don't need to stand up for this one. Just give me your best one-handed jazz hand. Let me see those fingers twirl. The true false, I've got some faces here. You did well on this one. This one is true, this one is true. So Watson uh, is, um, uh, you know, I would, I would argue the most important technological innovation of our age. IBM calls Watson uh, uh, a cognitive computing platform. And the short story of that is that we are moving from a world in which we program computers, we instruct them, you know, how to do certain things, to a world where very sophisticated artificial intelligence like Machine learning, deep learning, there's a whole bunch of stuff there. Uh, these applications teach themselves. It is a machine that learns by itself. So it will learn over time. So Watson is by far the most sophisticated uh, cognitive computing, intelligent, insistent, natural language decision support tool on the market. Siri is a joke compared to Watson. Right? 
And I'm one of these futurists. I'm a, I'm a droid PC guy. I still believe in Microsoft. I can't stand Apple, right? I, every time I work on Apple, I'm like, why do people make so much of a fuss here? Um, Watson is far and away the most significant one. But this is a field that is starting to heat up. Google has a service called Google Now, which it categor categorizes as an anticipatory system. So if you're traveling to uh, DC or Seattle and um, you step off the plane, off the train, you flip up your droid and it says, you know, 20 minutes to your hotel. And you think, I didn't tell Google that I was staying at that hotel, right? And how does it know that there's a traffic accident and it's going to be a little longer, right? It has gone through your emails, scraped that, knows you're staying there, has checked the traffic, and has said, you know, this is the best way to go there. Now, there's a line that is very creepy, and for some people, that's a line that they want to stay on this side, right? But then when you realize that Google Now has helped you save an hour sitting in traffic in Chicago and you've taken the train, you're like, well, I'll cross that creepy line, right? So Google now is one, and then the, the, the startup that I have a uh, happily married man, love my wife, but I have a man crush on, on the CEO of MindMeld, um, which is a, a, a company that has developed a contextual search engine um, that allows individuals to, again, just naturally speak to the application. And as you speak to the application, it will bring up search results based off of the keywords that you've said and in the context of your life as it knows it. MindMeld has released its application as an API, and its vision is that any organization can build a light version of IBM Watson on top of its products and services. Right? So this is a world in which we need to anticipate jobs not just being online or social and influenced by all those changes, but a world in which jobs are heavily influenced through artificial intelligence that's not perfect, but much better than anything we've seen in the past. Right? So how do we prepare ourselves for that future? So uh, I'm an academically trained futurist. Um, uh, I attended a graduate degree program at the University of Houston. There is a future studies program there that grew out of a culture in the 1960s and 70s um, in Houston around NASA and the hydrocarbon sector. So both of those industries needed to develop a, long, a, a better way of having uh, a structured look at long-term change. So future studies is not a crackpot discipline. It is essentially the study of social change. And there are many qualitative and quantitative forecasting methods that we use. Um, I don't have time to go into them. I want to just plant one seed. And it is a technique, a frame, kind of a lens that futurists use uh, was popularized by uh, uh, colleagues at the University of Hawaii Future Studies program, and it's called Four Futures. So if we think about the future of an industry, the future of a, a community or a country, we can imagine there are four potential outcomes, right? There's the continued growth. This is the world in which you know, things that we do um, uh, are fine, and we just continue to do that and kind of blue skies ahead, right? Then there's the disciplined, constrained future, this is the world where we still do the same thing. Our job is essentially the same, but there's more head, headwinds pushing on us, right? A little bit more difficult. So if I'm Microsoft or I'm a, I'm a coal company, I'm looking at a constrained future. Then there's a transformed future. This is a world where we look around and we say, you know what? The world has changed, and our business is fundamentally different than in the past. So you go across the... The, the river over to New Jersey. For 30 years, the pharmaceutical uh, sector was built by chemical engineers, chemical synthesis of pharmaceuticals. And over the past five years, they have been transforming that industry towards biologics, biological engineering. IBM went from a hardware company to a service company. That's a transformed future. And then there's the decline collapse, right? This is the, the Kodak and the Blackberry world. Right? where you just look at the future and you say, it doesn't look good. So futurists will work with clients to help them imagine a range of scenarios. Right? The whole purpose of thinking about the future is to be able to imagine uh, a range of outcomes over multiple time horizons right? and multiple scenarios. You're not trying to predict what will happen. That is impossible. Right? 
you're really trying to prepare for what we call a cone of plausibility. So that's the, the, uh, the, the uh, introduction to foresight. Uh, I want to move now to uh, drivers of change. Um, very grateful to, to hear Jim's comments um, that were highly localized. Uh, I'm going to start at a much higher level. I think uh, uh, kind of with the global story. I think a skill set that all individuals will need, regardless of, of your current um, uh, kind of job professional uh, duties, is to hone in on your capacity to understand demographic transitions, right? So big changes in large groups of people, and then also be able to develop business strategies that create demand, create consumer or business demand. So I want to look, what is the lens then that's going to shape this? So the world as we know it, you know, really started after World War II. Prior to that, you know, 50 years, it was that unwinding of the colonial age, right? Really, life as we know it in America started after World War II. That was the world where the West and West economy defined job creation and job dynamics, right? And then in the 1990s, we saw some uh, demographic shifts in uh, East Asia, uh, shift in technology, cost structures started to change in major industries, and we started to see growth around globalization of an East to West economy, right? And this is a story I think we all know well. What is the next era for globalization in terms of flows and dynamics? We've done west to west, east to west. Maybe north to south. North to south, right? That's, that's, that, that is the one that has the biggest dollars, right? That's the one that has the biggest kind of wealth transfer. The one that I think is most strategic, right? Much smaller by size, right? There's no measure that's going to you know, beat out north to south. But the one that is most critical as a global strategy is the south to south economy. This is not a world where it matters what the US does with Angola, what US does with India. It's a world where what matters most is what India and Angola, what China and Nigeria do together. The southern hemisphere to southern hemisphere cultural and economic interactions I would argue, are the most important investment uh, that we need to make to have the jobs that will you know, drive us forward. Why? Because these are the nations that have what economists and demographers will call the demographic dividend. A demographic dividend is a, 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 about a 20 or 30 year period in which societies have a large number of young people that they've invested in go through their teenage college years, through their first jobs, and enter that peak earning season, let's say mid-30s, late 50s. That is the demographic dividend, right? In the US, our demographic dividend was in the 90s. That was, you know, big box retail, get, get rid of my minivan, I'm gonna get an SUV, right? I'm gonna get a house with a closet that was bigger than my bedroom in my old house. We had a demographic dividend payout of the baby boomers in the 1990s. The demographic dividends of the future are going to be in India and Pakistan and Angola and Nigeria. And we can sit back and we can say, well, let, let, them, let them, good luck, right? And think about job growth here. Or we can say, you know what? Our professional services, our skills, to enable a successful South-to-South -South economy will lead to more jobs in the United States, right? They will lead to, we'll become China's healthcare service provider. That would be great. We'll become India's education provider. They would love it, we would love it, right? So how do we think of the job landscape proactively around investments in the South-to-South economy? So this is a, a map that has floated around the internet in, in recent days. It was created by a Reddit user. Oh my goodness, I'm way behind. Um, uh, uh, and it was, uh, you know, it, it's, it's, a, it's a, a, you know, I was like, Jim's gonna hate this, right? It's a, it's a bit shady, right? It's economic activity basically in metro regions, you know, there's no Denver. 
Um, so I kind of, you know, I, I don't really agree with it, but it, but it points to the, the real story. And the real story here is that when you think about the creation of jobs and policies that create jobs and investments and organization of individuals, uh, it has become localized at the metro level. Metropolitan regions are driving innovation and driving job creation, much even more so than state or federal policies, right? So how do we teach ourselves the various lenses of metropolitan economies? And we'll, we'll kind of let you learn more uh, through those various lenses. So that's the global picture, then there's the, the city metro picture. Um, I wanna end this part with a look at what I think is the most important demographic transition for uh, the US economy to get right. And that is reversing the, the popular assumption that aging and the aging of the baby boomer population is a terrible thing. Flipping that around in a way that we describe aging as active aging, as creative aging, that empowers aging baby boomers to live longer, healthier, more active lives. Why? Because they got all the money. They have all the money. And there are a lot of poor baby boomers that are gonna be aging that need help. It's you know, a big spectrum. Active aging and this idea of jobs to support aging in place, where your mother or father, can, they can live in their home or they can live with roommates and they don't have to go to an institution. Aging in place. Those types of jobs, I think, are going to uh, enable uh, the wealth to be recycled in that group. All right, I've got, how many minutes? I love it. So we're gonna shift gears here. We're gonna move on from people and demographics and we're gonna talk about data. Um, but there's, I wanna get your minds, you've had a long days, I know you've had long days. There's something in your mind that actually, there's a trigger in your mind uh, that opens up uh, the process of learning um, and it's the, the lever is a big fake smile. So I want to see the biggest fake smile across this Columbia Alumni Network group that I can. Oh, Harvard was much better, guys. Come on, come on, come on. All right, there we go. So data, 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 right? And when you're a futurist and you go out in the world, you know, people will be like, are you going to talk about big data, right? And it's just like a big target and they're going to hate it and they think it's a bunch of you know, BS marketing stuff. So you, know, you cannot avoid data, right? So I'm gonna try to give you a different lens around data. So data is not really the story, right? Uh, there's absolutely an explosion in data. Big data by definition, the, the, the way to think about it is the three Vs, right? Volume, the amount, velocity, right? The speed, real time, and variety, right? We have sentiment status update data. We have doors data, data from light bulbs, data from your cars. You know, data is coming from different various sources. So the three Vs. Most people, they don't need to worry about big data in their everyday jobs, right? Most people don't need to worry about that, unless you're in finance or healthcare or retail. What is really important is going to be the algorithms and the software applications that take that data and create value. That is the most important story. And this is a world that can be very frightening because it leads you to think in terms of, you know, my job is gonna be lost, right? Just like the, 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 the blue collar worker who lost his job to a robot, you know, me, the accountant, me, the, I mean, if you're a media buy, uh, ad buyer, if you're a me ad buying in media, I got a software program that can do your job better than you can, right? There's a fear factor of automation. And a great book to get yourself uh, kind of framed is called The Second Machi Machine Age. This is happening in industries far and wide. This notion of kind of automation um, is happening uh, um, in the biosciences. There's a company called Transcriptic, which basically takes lab work by, you know, that humans have done and automates it through robotics. So there's a very scary scenario of massive disruption through 
software automation, right? I do not think that that scenario will be true. I, I really don't think it's going to be true. But in order for it to not be true, we're gonna have to realize what's the positive scenario, right? And the positive scenario is captured here by Eric Walters, right? Yeah, automatic, you know, stuff on the bench, great. I hated doing that in college, right? So the attitude is going to have to become great. Take the menial, you know, stuff that I hate doing in my service and knowledge sector job, take all that stuff, put it away, give me the creative juicy stuff. So what are jobs that are likely to come out of this world? They're gonna be jobs that can capture and create new forms of data, right? Both from individuals, various social you know, environments. They're gonna be jobs and industries and companies that are able to capture data from a field that we now refer to as connected devices, right? This is a world in which you know, your car uh, is you know, producing tremendous amount of data. Google purchased Nest for $3 billion. Nest is a, uh, a thermostat company and a smoke alarm company. They're creating connected devices for a smart home, right? This world of personal data and connected to device data um, requires companies to establish relationships with individuals based off of trust. Right? And your job, I think, is going to be to help build that trust with your customers, whether they're consumers or business, um, in this future. I think that will be part of um, our duties. So just to give you a perspective of, you know, you think, oh, a talking thermostat, um, there's talking toothbrushes, right? The toothbrush is a connected device, and it knows that your three-year-old, you know, only brushed for 30 seconds, and then it you know, gives you data, and you're like, these things are ridiculous, right? Um, this notion of connected devices falls under the framing of Internet of Things sometimes. It will be larger than the smartphones in the PC world, right? So how do we prepare for a world in which tremendous amounts of data drive innovation in our industries? So I want to end with two things that I think you need to learn more about. Two ways of thinking about data that I think will improve your ability to thrive in this world. The first is to recognize that there's a value chain to data, right? The least descriptive data that exists in the world is, is descriptive. It's what happened. And most of us, our jobs are based off of descriptive data reports. You come into a meeting and it's like you give you know, your colleagues data of what happened in the past, right? That's 1950s stuff. The more valuable form of data and analytics insight is predictive. And as we look at the future of our jobs, the ability to work with predictive software programs will be part of our everyday. But the most valuable form of data, the most valuable form of insight that you can you know, capture on your own as a, as a, uh, as a person, the most valuable form of insight that you can deliver to your clients, to your customers, to the consumer, is prescriptive. It's the recommendation. What should come next? Right? So there are now health companies that are being prescriptive. You should do this if you want to achieve that outcome. There are financial banks that are developing prescriptive services say, if you want to achieve this outcome, you need to do this. Students are working with prescriptive, adaptive learning tools. So this is the first lens. The first lens is get your job out of the descriptive data set, get your job into the predictive and prescriptive world. And this will require you to go out and get a badge, right? It's going to require you to take a course on data science. It's going to require you to learn more, right? So that's the first thing. The second thing, and I'm done, my fire hose is done in, in three slides here. The second thing I think you want to learn more about is how we choose to structure data. Most of us have been working with data in our jobs around um, uh, tables, Excel spreadsheets, rows and columns, what we call relational databases, right? made Oracle a very uh, big company. 
And when we look at the world today and we look at innovation, the, the structure of how people store data is in a graph. It's in a graph. And a graph is essentially kind of a node and a connector, right? So Lisa and John are friends, and she's a patron of the theater. He's a trustee. And Bill's over here. We don't know Bill. He attends a show. He meets Lisa. Now Bill has a way to introduce himself to John, right? It's a graph. Graph structures have been behind the most dynamic companies of the past 15 years. Google is essentially a link graph company, right? Their search engine was better because they said, well, if 100 people are linking to that node, that node is the most important node in that search. And then the interest graph came along, match.com, Instagram cat tags, Twitter. That's an interest graph. The social graph is LinkedIn, Facebook, the most dynamic companies of our age think about the world in terms of relationships of things. Not relational spreadsheet Excel databases from hell, but relationships, connect, connected data. So if you are in an industry that deals with learning or training or health or transportation or finance, you want to think about how graph-based data might change the future of your job. So, a thing and a fun thing you can do kind of to get yourself started, put in, go to MIT has that application called Immersion. Uh, and you're gonna have to take a leap of faith, cross the creepy line, you put in your email address, and it will show you your personal graph in terms of people you know. And you're gonna look up here and be like, ooh, I hate him, right? He makes me email him all the time. So, I've got a website that's up. You're thinking, what is he talking about with graphs, right? I'll give you videos to watch. <laughs> I'm a fire hose speaker. I know I throw a lot at you. At 7 o'clock on a, you know, a weekday, we've had a long day at work. This is usually the face that I get from people, right? It's that shock and awe, like, I don't want to deal with Watson at work, right? This is the face that I want to get you to. I got a three-year-old and a three-month-old. This is the three-year-old when he was six months and adorable before he became a little you know, turd. <laughs> there was a point in your life where you just said, I don't understand things, and you had a smile on your face, and you were like, I'm going to move towards it, right? I don't understand the keys. I'm going to shake them. I'm going to throw them in the trash. Watch Dad get mad. I don't understand the door. I'm going to open and close the door 25,000 times because I don't understand it. And you had a smile on your face. And now people come in front of you and they say, Oh, you know, data is going to be part of your world. You're going to have to learn predictive analytics tools. You're going to be working with an artificial agent. And you're like, I don't want to do that. I don't want to have to get on Twitter, right? And we're grumpy. We're grumpy. So I want to figure out a way to get you to do it with a smile on your face. If you're that futurist, that's awesome. And your job is to socialize awesome, right? Your job is to form a signals team within your organization. Get three people that are just curious and say, look, we're going to scan the news and then we're going to have our own little TED talk on the last Friday of every month. And we're going to you know, take over the break room and present to our colleagues the ideas that we think are going to change our industry. If you're someone that thinks, you know, I'm the, you know, uh, I'm the, the empowerment person, I like this stuff, I want to empower others, I don't have time. Your job is to lower the barriers to experimentation. Your job is to encourage smart risk-taking within your teams, right? And if you think that I am filled with nonsense and that IBM Watson is not going to change the healthcare industry and IBM Watson, if you think that, that is perfectly fine because futurists have been wrong before. We've been wrong before. Your job is to figure out which assumptions I hold are wrong. So I have two R's in my name. There's a Gary with one R. He's British running on the run, on the run from the British government living in Colombia. <laughs> Happy to take emails, but if you write me, make sure you have two R's in that message. Um, and then I've got this website. It is live. A copy of the presentation is online. I've got some resources up there now, and I will be uploading more videos and stuff uh, this evening. So with that, I went over by a few minutes, so turn it over to Dan. Thank you.